Human beings have always had a tendency to degrade members of their own kind. At a brown bag lunch at the Portland Public Library, author David Livingstone Smith talked about his new book, Less Than Human, about how behavior that led to the Holocaust and other atrocities is still being practiced today. Brian Knobloch spoke with him about his observations. So David, let's talk a little bit about the basic tenets and philosophy of the book itself. Okay, well what this book is, it's the first serious study of the phenomenon of dehumanization. It's a word that's thrown around a lot, but no one has really looked into what goes on when human beings think of other groups of human beings as actually subhuman creatures. So that's what the book, book is all about. It's looking at the history of this, this phenomenon and most importantly trying to understand what goes on when we do this to each other. And what does go on? Well, that's a long story um, and you have to read the book really to understand fully what goes on. Suffice it to say that we attribute a non-human essence to a group of people and the reason that we do that is that it it removes our inhibitions, it disables our moral inhibitions against committing acts of violence towards them. Uh, and that can manifest itself in, in large and small scale y Yes, it can manifest actions. in large and small scale actions, but generally speaking it's a collective phenomenon. So it's a whole group of people that's dehumanized. And this goes back thousands of years. Oh yes, it goes back as far as we have records. We find in ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China, references to dehumanization. And what was your interest? What sparked your interest in this? Well, subject? my I, in 2004, I wrote a book called Why We Lie, which was about deception and self-deception. And then in 2007, I did a book called The Most Dangerous Animal, which was about war, the psychology of war. And I was interested in self-deception in war. Now, when studying that, I came across the prevalence of dehumanization in war. And I realized that there really wasn't a proper literature on this. It's a terribly important thing to understand. And so I thought it was a worthwhile project to roll up my sleeves and, and try to make a start. Uh, in the book, you talked uh, a fair amount about the Holocaust as an example. How did it manifest itself? in that situation? Well, you know, the, the, the Nazi mission was an extremely moralistic one. They conceived of what they were doing in moral terms. And they thought it was their moral responsibility to rid the earth of evil. That happens in virtually every genocide. The Jewish people, they thought, were the paradigm of evil. And indeed, they explicitly considered them as non-human creatures, as untermenschen, as subhumans. So, so, uh, so there was a great deal of effort directed towards explaining that Jews and other so-called inferior races were not really human beings and therefore it was permissible to destroy them. And all of their actions sort of came out of that. And they, That's right. And they yeah. didn't feel it was wrong. No, no, they thought it was right. They thought it would be wrong not to do that. And people would argue, what about free will. I mean, if this has been ingrained in people for thousands of years, mm -hmm. people don't have a choice? Where, where does that come in? Uh, yeah, well, we all have choices about all sorts of things, but we're also all vulnerable to certain psychological dispositions and certain forms of influence. So when exposed, say, to propaganda that plays on our vulnerabilities, plays on the basic psychological equipment we have that inclines us towards this kind of xenophobic attitude, then we very easily fall into this way of thinking, all of us. This conflict between the, the need to dehumanize and in your, in your philosophy, in the, in the book you talk about how it overcomes people's natural inhibition against cruelty. Yes. Will dehumanization always win that battle? No, not necessarily, and it, it often doesn't. It's, it's, it's a very important point that we do have inhibitions, deep moral inhibitions, and I think it's part of human nature, uh, to avoid killing or doing terrible harm to our fellow human beings. And so when we're inclined to do those things, perform such actions, we also need to find some ways of disabling our inhibitions, and dehumanization is a way of disabling these inhibitions. Now, 
uh, dehumanization doesn't always win, <laughs> you know, fortunately. But we need to understand much more about it so we can prevent it from occurring. Right? To, to, uh, we need to be able to support the inhibitions more effectively. As a philosopher, larger picture of humanity, what's your sort of view of, of this? Is it, uh, is it uh, something that is, can be changed over the long term? or is It, it can, be but, but there, there's a problem, which is that governments who want to send their citizens to perpetrate violence against others are not going to be interested in solving this problem. Mm -hmm. They're going to be interested in finding ways to motivate people to perform acts of violence at their behest. So it's really very much up to us, it's up to public intellectuals, it's up to the mass media to be vigilant about these forms of influence, these forms of propaganda, and to be vigilant about uh, calling attention to dehumanizing rhetoric as soon as it starts making its appearance.